Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about, well, I was asked to give a survey talk on uh, the Noidal approach to categorical quantum mechanics. Uh, not, possibly not exactly the name I would have chosen, but um, what is true is that, I mean, Chris was actually mentioning, uh, well, there were two Chris's this morning. Chris Eichen was mentioning in his talk uh, that there are already several different approaches within topos theoretic approaches to physics. And more broadly, we can already see that there are several approaches, which we can call broadly categorical approaches to physics. There's the work of uh, Lewis Crane, who's speaking this meeting, John Byers, Dolan, and others, uh, using higher dimensional categories, ideas of categorification, relations to topological quantum field theories, and other things. Um, there's the work that I'll be describing, which uh, sort of program of work that I started with uh, Bob Cooker, uh, and many other people have contributed to by now. We'll be hearing other talks about it today as well, um, and uh, where we're using, indeed, certain kinds of monoidal categories with additional structure, as, as we'll see. And, um, of course, the topos theoretic approach that we heard about uh, this morning. So uh, just to sort of locate this in there. And uh, the idea is to give um, an introduction to this kind of work that we've been doing um, uh, in, a, in the group at Oxford and with, with various colleagues elsewhere uh, also contributing, uh, which could be called monoidal, it could be called linear, and perhaps uh, to be doing linear quantum mechanics sounds, sounds quite good, uh, quite appropriate. Uh, in fact, uh, it will turn out that the fact that we're in monoidal categories, although that's a very basic part of the setting, is already quite significant. Uh, in fact, if we're, if we're talking about logic as well, which is another aspect of the, the sort of general theme of this, uh, this workshop and this series, then if we're talking about logical inference, even before we introduce any connectives, uh, it's quite important to know what the significance of the humble comma is. And uh, uh, that's uh, something like the... Um, significance of whether we're in a monoidal or a Cartesian uh, setting. Um, so anyway, uh, let's uh, continue with this. So let, let me just um, make a couple of brief comparisons with the other approaches, uh, just as something to keep in mind as we, as we go through. So a comparison with the topos approach. Um, so uh, as we've just said, it, we're in a setting of monoidal rather than Cartesian categories. Of course, Cartesian then extending up to the rich structure of uh, toposes, which means on the logical side that we're in the realm of some kind of linear or resource-sensitive logic, so to speak, as opposed to intuitionistic logic, which uh, Chris was describing. Um, Perhaps at a more, uh, a more subtle point is that, in some sense, what we're, what we're, as we heard in Chris's talk, the topos approach is very much concerned with the propositions that we make about uh, physical quantities and the results of uh, uh, making observations on physical states and so on. So there's a lot of emphasis on propositions and the structure of propositions. Um, whereas, in some sense, what we're looking at is the structure of the physical processes themselves, and that's what we want to directly model in the kind of categories we're dealing with. And this actually goes back, again, to quite a deep um, distinction at the logical level, uh, a kind of distinction between uh, the, something like a more model-theoretic view of logic, where we're using logic to describe and talk about structures, make propositions about structures, as opposed to thinking of logical type theories and the like, thinking of the Curry-Howard correspondence um, cate and categorical proof theory and so on, where we think of logic as a structure in itself, as directly exhibiting the kind of structure that we want to study. So we could spend the whole hour talking about that, but I just make this as a, as a side remark here. And there are also different kinds of connections with geometry. Uh, because we're, in a sense, we're focusing on, on the processes themselves, uh, we'll see that geometric considerations about um, our, our objects in the category, which we may think of as proofs, we want to think logically. So we'll see some kind of direct geometry of proofs in the, the sort of diagrammatic um, calculus for monoidal categories that we'll discuss. And we can contrast that with the key role of geometric logic in toposes. So two different kinds of interface between logic and geometry in some sense. 
So I think there's, there's a lot, it's, it's a fascinating point to compare the points of view and perhaps ultimately to try and synthesize the, the common good uh, elements or ingredients from, from both these approaches. And uh, to make some sort of brief, briefer comparison with the N categories <coughs> approach, that has mostly, I think, been, been focused obviously on the, on the aim of quantum gravity um, and, and in some sense thinking of in, in the quantum gravity setting, as Chris has often emphasized, or quantum cosmology, we're thinking of the whole universe, so there's nobody outside the universe to observe it. Um, we're quite we're concerned, as we'll see, with operational aspects, uh, although we're not taking any particular philosophical stance, instrumentalist or otherwise. Certainly the interplay between quantum and classical kinds of information is very important, something we want to be able to describe. And for example, since we're interested also in applications in quantum information and computation, it plays an essential role there. <coughs> and for similar kinds of reasons, uh, we're interested in, in methods which are compositional, which goes along naturally with the fact that we're interested in studying open rather than closed systems. And the, and the point of an open system is that it's not the whole universe. There's some other larger system that it may ultimately be seen as a part of. We're interested in studying the interactions between this part and others. So these are partly, I think, important for these kind of applications in quantum informatics, but they also have a foundational significance as well on the way we're, we're looking at things. Okay, so now uh, sort of picking up this idea that we're, we're not taking any particular philosophical stance, we are interested in looking at things from what we can think of either as an operational point of view or a process point of view. And one can sort of make some, again, some nice discussion about uh, thinking of operations or thinking of processes. If we, we're thinking in a quantum information setting or, or in a, or in a um, kind of instrumentalist scenario, we may think of operations that we're performing in a quantum computer or maybe in a, in a lab and so on. Or we may just think uh, in, in a more sort of objective way of the unfolding of a quantum process. But it is those, those quantum processes themselves that we're interested in describing in some direct fashion. So let's firstly have a brief review of what um, quantum operations look like and how they contrast with those that are available from a classical point of view. And uh, by the way, I should say, I know there are world experts on, on sort of probably all, all the topics I'll, I'll be covering sitting in the room here, but I'm, since there's a diversity of backgrounds, I'm not particularly assuming ever, ever anything and it'll be all be very introductory and, uh, and simple-minded. Um, so, um, so uh, classically, if we, so we, uh, here I'm focusing just on the, the computational point of view and uh, quantum information, classical in versus classical information point of view. And it's certainly fair to say, I think, that the work on quantum information has re-energized discussion of the foundations of quantum mechanics, otherwise been a bit dormant for some time. It, it gives a new angle on thinking about some old questions. So, of course, from the point of view of classical information or classical computation, we have the ordinary classical bits, very much like the, the sort of classic, well, like the classical truth values, the Booleans that we were hearing about from a logical point of view, but we can do things like making copies of them, reading them as many times as we like, um, and manipulating them in an arbitrary fashion. So all the things we take for granted in the classical model of computation. So when we go to the quantum picture, we now have this uh, sphere of values. So we have a two-dimensional complex vector space is the usual space of qubits. Uh, and the kind of operations that we have available uh, we are performing measurements and um, uh, uh, performing uh, data transformations, which are now restricted to be unitary transformations. So these are, in a sense, highly restricted. There are a lot of them because we have continuous data in the, in the sphere, but they're essentially just rotations of the sphere, um, uh, which uh, are, uh, must be reversible and so on, linear and uh, uh, isometries and so on. Um, and as far as qu quantum measurements are concerned, they're very different from the kinds of tests that we can do in, in classical information. Um, so uh, if we think of applying a measurement to some uh, usual story, apply to some uh, state vector, uh, we measure in some basis that we choose. This is exactly a particular case of the choice of a commutative subalgebra of a... Um, uh, an observational context, setting, uh, choosing a particular measurement apparatus, if you like, choosing a basis for measuring in, and then the given state uh, is when we measure is going to collapse onto one of our 
basis states of our measurement, with prob not deterministically, but with probabilities determined by the, um, by the angle between the, uh, the state and the, uh, the basis vectors here. And so we see two aspects to this. Um, we, uh, the outcome is not certain, it's probabilistic. And um, also, whatever the state was before we performed the measurement, well, we don't know any, well, we, all we know after the measurement is that it's now one of these, um, this is the projection postulate that if we perform the same measurement again, we'll get the, immediately we'll get the same answer. So we've collapsed the state down to one of the possible answers. So measurements change the state and, and in some sense destroy information. This is the retrodictive aspect of quantum measurements. So this, from a, if you're th thinking from the point of view of what we can do with, with quantum systems for information processing purposes, this sounds extremely bad news. We have such unreliable and destructive uh, measurements or tests. But of course we get uh, a, a richness in, in other ways that, that isn't possible from the classical uh, information processing or physical perspective. So we get in particular quantum entanglement uh, so here we have uh, Bell state and uh, EPR state. So we have pairs of qubits now, which may be in entangled states. Um, and what that means is that uh, if we measure one of the qubits, uh, we may get the answer either zero or one, again, with some probability distribution. Here it's the uniform one, but, uh, and I haven't added, put in normalizing constants. Um, but if we do, uh, whatever answer we get, we get the answer zero here, then by the collapse of the entangled state, if someone were to measure the other qubit, they would get the same answer that we just got. And this kind of toy version of the EPR state has an anti-correlation. If we get zero in one, then we would get one in the other and vice versa. And this possibility arises inevitably because compound systems in the quantum setting are represented by the tensor product of Hilbert spaces. Because states are closed under, is saying that because states are closed under superposition, uh, a general state in this compound system is some linear combination of pairs of states, not a single pair of states. And for example, by setting some of these coefficients to zero, we can arrange tight correlations, as we see exemplified here, between um, what happens in, in one of these qubits and what may happen in the other. So superposition can be used to encode correlation. And this is, of course, Einstein's spooky action at a distance. And even if the particles are spatially separated, there's still this, in principle, instantaneous uh, effect of uh, state collapse, performing a measurement at one site, having an impact on the other. And Bell's theorem is saying that um, um, the, this kind of non-locality of effects of measurements is, is an essential feature of... Uh, uh, of quantum mechanics because any because you can't rig up a, 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 a local realistic theory in the sense that, that Einstein thought it axiomatic that physical theories had to be uh, to achieve these uh, the degree of correlation that we can in quantum mechanics. So these are the Bell inequalities setting bounds to the correlations that can be achieved uh, in local realistic theories and those bounds are exceeded or violated by quantum mechanics and all physical tests so far of the Bell inequality is, it goes on with very subtle kind of um, <laughs> ruling out of uh, possible uh, subtle uh, um, sort of uh, assumptions and so on. But nevertheless, all tests confirm that quantum mechanics is, is right and that quantum mechanics and the world is essentially non-local in this sense. And that's one of the ways of expressing why quantum mechanics is a puzzling thing. Okay, so that's a little taste of uh, what we're trying to capture here. Um, so what I want to do now is just proceed by layers and, and start by asking a sort of general question. What would a general formalism for describing physical processes look like that would be an appropriate place for describing this view of operations or unfolding of physical processes? Um, so what, what, what do we need to have in, in such a formalism? So following this operational process philosophy, which actually fits rather well with the, the categorical philosophy that uh, uh, Chris was um, reminding us of in his talk this morning, the, the structure should be carried by the uh, operations or the, the, the actions themselves, not in, not in the elements. We, we shouldn't look to saying what, um, 
preordaining what kind of structures we're dealing with in terms of what kind of elements they have, but rather how we can act on um, the information that we have. Now, a point that may not seem so evident, but is uh, uh, from the physics point of view, but is extremely evident from the experience gained in, in logic, computer science, category theory, and so on, is that a great deal is gained if operations are typed, if we can distinguish different kinds of operations in terms of what kind of input they can be applied to and what kind of output they can produce. And actually, one actually reads uh, some sort of development of physical material, such types are always there. In fact, if we're going to start writing systems in, as tensor products, of Hilbert spaces, we've already got some rudimentary type structure right there. There has to be some basic reflection of time. So you see, I just want to be as general as possible here. And from an operational point of view, we must at least have the idea that we can firstly perform one operation and then perform some other operation afterwards. And, you know, um, getting undressed, having the shower, or vice versa, which is uh, the other Chris was reminding us, uh, not, not commutative. Um, and uh, a basic reflection of space uh, that uh, we should be able to describe compound systems uh, in just the way we were seeing there with pairs of qubits and other kinds of systems spread out in space and be able to talk about operations which are localized to part of a compound systems and, which, and, and being able to perform operations independently on different parts of a compound system. So if Alice is here and Bob is there, then Alice should be able to do something locally in her part of the world and, and Bob in his part of the world. So uh, what we in computer science refer to as parallel composition. Yes? Apart yes. from very, very Well, I mean, I, th I, would say, I would say this is very neutral. I mean, I, it, it's, um, we, we should be able to express the things I described, but it doesn't imply anything about simultaneity or anything like that. Actually, the notion of parallelism I have here is independence. And this, uh, this even at the, in terms of classical computation, it, it's a sort of standard point that we don't order actions in general. Yeah, but you talk about compound systems. Yes. Well, I... Yes. Um, well, uh, I, I... Well, uh, there, is a, there is a point there, and I, of course, uh, in some sense, in the end, if we knew what quantum gravity should look like, we might have a different well, view of things. Exactly. But, there, but there's certainly, in what I'm saying here, there's nothing, for example, that is at all contradictory to relativity. And actually, the kind of general notion of process I'm describing here does fit very well with the kinds of process models that have been developed in computer science, discrete process models that are very deeply informed by relativity. I'm particularly thinking of Petrinet theory. So sequential because, so, so sequential because, because in, you know, in, in, some, in some circumstances we can, you know, following a timeline, if you will, we can definitely say that one thing was, was before another because there is a causal causal relation that's between them. Yeah, but that's then localized to the individual. Yes. There's no, no description of global no, time here no, at no. all. It, it's, it's a, it, this is really meant to be very neutral with respect to such assumptions, and it definitely accommodates... The, I mean, one of the interesting things, it seems to me, that does come from computer science is that we already have it's really an important issue, even in sort of classical computation. Everything is discrete. To, to not be able to, be, to give a total time order on things. And that, that's really quite important. So we have these partially ordered models, where the partial order is something like a causal order, and some of it is very directly informed by uh, relativistic thinking, in fact. So this is just meant to be uh, a sufficient uh, language to be able to talk about such things. Um, so in a sense, the, the kind of series of parallel I'm talking about here are opposite extremes. One where you definitely have a causal precedence because you're on one single sort of time uh, trajectory and, and, and other cases where, where you can make no, no assumption of causal dependence. So you can think of it as causal independence, if you like. And that may be a better reading. I mean, maybe I uh, was a bit careless in my uh, use of... Uh, but remember, this is only a, a very abstract reflection of these things. Uh, so it's not committing us to any particular view of um, space-time.
And the, um, so the, the, and in fact, the kind of uh, setting that I'm suggesting here, just following from these desiderata, is the very general notion of symmetric monoidal category. So um, uh, most people, of course, uh, know a great deal here, know a great deal of category theory, but I mean, just to make the point that one, because categories are not committed to thinking of things in terms of elements, we just have arrows and their behavior under composition and so on, so that frees, that liberates the possibility to have categories in which the arrows are not functions, but maybe processes of various kinds. And this has, again, proved to be enormously useful in computer science in various contexts. So indeed, we can think of a category as just providing us a language where we have uh, typed uh, processes or operations and the ability to have one operation performed after another. Uh, so that, that's just the idea of composition. Um, and in logic, uh, we can have an interpretation where we think of the, the objects as propositions uh, the, um, and the arrows as proofs. So, the arrow, so we're not talking about provability notice, but about proof. So it's still a kind of process view of, of, of proof, if you like. And in programming, we can think of the objects as data types and the, uh, the arrows as programs. Um, and in, uh, yeah, oh, okay. I, uh, and the idea is that in quantum mechanics, we can think of types of system or kinds of system, perhaps one might prefer to say, and um, the kinds of operations or processes that can be performed, which um, uh, transform one kind of system into another. It may, of course, leave us with the same kind of system that we started off with, but that will be a special case. So that's just having a category, and a symmetric monoidal category will then have, of course, a binary functor, which uh, up to coherent natural isomorphism is associative and commutative. Um, so it's possible to uh, sort of elide the isomorphisms for associativity for most purposes, but one has to be more careful about symmetry, and symmetry is actually the most interesting one to perturb because then, then you get, well, uh, because then one gets sort of very interesting geometric possibilities, uh, for example, having braiding rather than symmetry. But here we're just looking at symmetric uh, monoidal categories, so we have uh, the ability to interchange components and the usual uh, naturality conditions. And the sense in which I meant uh, sort of independence it becomes manifest when we just look at what follows from bifunctoriality. So we have a system which is described in terms of components, A1 and A2. I have a process F1 that takes me from a system of kind A1 to a system of kind B1, and similarly a process F2, uh, going from A2 to B2. And uh, the tensor product of these two things is independent. There is no defined order of doing one rather than the other. Uh, and computer science, this reminds us of the, the sort of classic idea of parallel composition of independent actions. Um, and as we've already suggested over here, um, there's a kind of logical component to this as well. Even though we have so little structure, the fact that tensor is not a Cartesian product uh, already has quite profound implications. We can't reconstruct an element of a tensor from its components. So we don't have pairing and we don't have projections, or we can say we don't have diagonals and we don't have projections. And the absence of diagonals means essentially that we don't have the ability to copy a state um, and that we don't have projections, that we don't have the ability to erase part of a state. Uh, and from the logical point of view, this, will this means that our comma is a resource-sensitive comma, and we don't have uh, rules corresponding to the structural rules of contraction and weakening. So one of Genson's brilliant insights, is, I mean, although it was a sort of side, sort of very uh, minor issue in, in, in his work, uh, was that there were, there were already rules you have to write down about the manipulation of comma that lets you duplicate premises and erase premises, the contraction and weakening rules. And of course, they're valid in intuitionistic logic as in classical logic. But in this monoidal or linear setting, we, they're, they're no longer uh, available in general. So such categories provide a setting for resource-sensitive logic such as linear logic. And in a sense, they're already building in uh, some form of no cloning and no deleting. And they're actually already, it leads to a new perspective on um, uh, the sort of axiomatics of no cloning and no deleting, which uh, 
I may mention, get to mention right at the end, and I think Ross may say something about in his <laughs> talk. Okay, so this is intended to be, I mean, it wasn't intended to sort of raise any, uh, sort of any, any hackles in terms of uh, importing assumptions. It's really intended to be a kind of rather anodyne and general setting for describing processes in a resource-sensitive way, closed under sequential and parallel composition. Um, one, well, uh, one objection to this is that this may be too abstract and we lose all grip of what's going on. And one answer to that objection is that we have uh, a very nice way of looking at these things in terms of the graphical or diagrammatic calculus with a sort of long tradition, most notable contribution being by Joel and Street, but uh, uh, following earlier ideas of, uh, from uh, Kelly's work, one could say, and um, uh, one can go back to Penrose's um, uh, graphical tensor notation, various other things. Once one starts tracing these kind of ideas, it, it sort of tends to go all the way back to the mists of time. Um, uh, yes, uh, actually, that uh, yes, indeed. Uh, we had a very interesting talk from Wilfred Hodges recently about uh, Avicenna, uh, which uh, um, anyway. Um, so the, part of this is that there are links to linear logic. I was saying that we can think of the arrows as proofs, so we can think of, in some sense, proofs as processes. Uh, and the diagrammatic notation links up to that in that these graphical, this leads to graphical representations of proofs in terms of things like proof nets. And also there is geometry of proofs lurking here, although I won't really have time to say much about that. There are very nice connections with things like the temporally leave algebra here. So in terms of the uh, sort of way of presenting this diagrammatic notation, so we indeed think of operations as boxes uh, which have input types and output types, and the fact that we have tensor product lets us have um, operations with, in which the inputs themselves have a structure of uh, several parts, a compound structure, and the output similarly. And the fact that we have sequential composition and parallel composition lets us uh, plug boxes together in the natural way. So you see this is really very non-committal, but it's already a powerful and useful language. And one of the nice points about using this geometry is that uh, just the simple geometry of the plane uh, absorbs a lot of the, the kind of algebraic housekeeping. So functor a lot of functoriality and naturality falls out if one's sort of thinking that <coughs> these diagrams, of course, are going to be taken to be the same up to some um, uh, equivalent side of sliding things around in the plane, or perhaps more generally, in the symmetric monoidal case, graph isomorphism. Um, so things become visually extremely evident. And going on just a little bit further, we see that already in this language we have a way of thinking about things that look very much like, well, that are a general notion of bras and kets. Um, so if we have, since we have a tensor unit, we can talk about um, arrows that have um, no input but an output, um, which may or may not be compound, and we can think of those as states, and, and, of course, we saw arrows going from the terminal object, which is the corresponding thing um, in, the, in the Cartesian uh, topos setting. Uh, so those would be like elements. They would be like uh, states if, uh, if our output type was, it was, a, was a type of states. And we dually have a notion of co-states, which, which are going to play a role in uh, the way we describe measurements. And we can compose uh, a state with a co-state to get something that has neither an input nor an output, and this is what we're going to call a scalar. So it's something that can float around and that um, uh, apparently may not look very interesting, but it turns out to be enormously useful and important in uh, addressing, again, something that emerged as a key issue in Chris's talk, namely the issue of where do quantities in our, in our modeling of physical theories come from. Now, notice that in the Cartesian setting, we're not going to have an interesting structure of scalars because we, there our unit is actually the terminal object and there can be at most one scalar, the identity. So it's tied down and there's nothing going on there. And also in the usual logical picture, we, don't, we won't have an interesting notion of scalars because the usual logical pictures abhor uh, vicious circles. But uh, circles are actually, uh, and loops are actually quite fun things. So I mean, let me just make the point here that this, again, thinking of operations, these states and co-states written as triangles like this indicate the sharp end says that there's no input or no output. 
This is like browsing tets in the Dirac notation. We can compose them to get things that have... So the types check in this, um, in this notation. Okay, so uh, a short interlude here, because uh, just to talk about scale, this is a very small miracle. Mathematically, it's a sort of negligible thing, but it's nevertheless a very useful thing. But just by working in a monoidal category, we have a language of scalars that has a, a large portion of the useful properties of scalars. Um, so we expect scalars to appear as, um, uh, for example, probabilistic weights in uh, quantum mechanics or... Uh, some particular kinds as, as the actual probabilities, um, um, the kind of quantities that we associate with measurements, uh, results, of, results of measurements and observations, as we were hearing earlier. Now, in the Cartesian setting, we're not going to get scalars living inside just as part of the, the very fa fabric of the category. But in the monoidal setting, we have enough freedom that this can happen in an interesting fashion. So, uh, we, remember, we're saying that a scalar is just... Uh, an endomorphism of the tensor unit. Now, if you think about vector spaces or Hilbert spaces, well, the tensor unit is the ground field, say the complex numbers, and a scalar is then a linear map from this one-dimensional Hilbert space to itself, which is determined by its image on, um, on one, by linearity, and therefore the scalars do correspond exactly to the elements of the ground field. So they are the scalars that we expect. In the category of relations, um, well, th just the category of relations in over the category of classical sets, of course, every topos has a corresponding category of relations. We just take the familiar classical category of sets where we're thinking of Cartesian product as our monoidal structure, which is not the categorical product in this category, but it does give us a symmetric monoidal structure. And the tensor unit is the one element set, but it's no longer terminal. Um, then the then um, well, what are the possible relations on a one element set? It's either the empty relation or the identities. So there are only two scalars, essentially the booleans. So we get back the booleans as our scalars in the case of uh, relations. In a sense, the poverty of the scalars in relations is why, although they will carry most of the structure that we're talking about, they're not rich enough to, uh, to be a place where quantum mechanics can really happen. But as a toy place where we can do many of those calculations, they're actually very useful and illuminating. Now, one little sort of uh, gem, uh, which is, for example, mentioned in the famous Kelly Laplace paper on coherence in compact closed categories, is that in generality, this monoid of scalars in any monoidal category is commutative, just following from monoidal coherence. So we already have a reasonable notion of multiplication of scalars, um, and it's always commutative. And the second point is that uh, each scalar induces a natural transformation on the identity functor, which gives us a notion of scalar multiplication, um, which has all the expected multiplicative properties of scalar multiplication. Um, so we, and geometrically, this will correspond to the fact that these little diamonds not having any wires coming in or out of them can float freely around the diagrams. And Penrose had exactly such things, notation for scalars in his abstract tensor notation. So we get, on the multiplicative level, there's no additive structure at the moment, uh, exactly the behavior we want for scalars, and that's already a nice thing. Okay, now let's add another little bit of structure uh, and go to dagger monoidal categories. And here we consider the idea of being able to turn an arrow around to reverse its direction. So the picture uh, here is simply a reflection in the um, x-axis, uh, the way we're drawing these diagrams. And what we're asking for is um, an identity on objects contravariant involutive functor. So uh, the objects stay the same. There's the, um, the direction of the arrows is reversed. If you do it twice, you get back where you started, and that, so that works with the reflection on the diagrammatics. And we get um, uh, the functorial properties. And again, in terms of our examples, um, of course, with Hilbert spaces, the dagger is going to be the adjoint. Uh, and in the case of relations, it's going to be relational converse. So these are two 
familiar examples to hang on to. And with that language, we can uh, not just have things that we call states and co-states, we can turn Kets into Bras and vice versa using the daggers. We really have the full-scale uh, Dirac notation, we might say, in that given uh, two states, we can think of as, uh, uh, I don't think should it be Kets or Bras, I, I, probably Bras, I think. We can turn one into a Ket and compose them, and again, the types check out, and what we get is a scalar, and that's our inner product. So we get the ability to do all those operations with all the expected properties at this level of structure. And the other crucial thing we can do is that we can define unitaries. So we know what an isomorphism is in any category. Once we have the dagger structure, we can say that an isomorphism is unitary if its inverse is its dagger. Um, and a dagger monoidal category is one in which the canonical isomorphisms for the monoidal structure are unitary. Uh, and, uh, well, we've, I mentioned the uh, sort of basic examples that we have. Um, there are interesting things that can be done on this level. For example, as uh, Bob has observed, one can do the um, uh, CPM construction just at this level of, of structure. But um, in some sense, we haven't got to the real meat yet. We, we actually haven't said anything yet which distinguishes us between a classical setting or a quantum setting. It could be either. So we're now going to raise the stakes and get onto things that are more distinctively quantum. So I want to talk now then about entanglement again, bell states, and compact categories. So we had a first look at entanglement earlier. Uh, so now let's uh, think about teleportation. Um, surprisingly only discovered in the 1990s, one might say, since the actual derivation from the principles of quantum mechanics is not so... Uh, uh, complex, but it, it shows the power of wa different ways of thinking about things. And perhaps from a physics point of view, the ultimate value of these categorical approaches will be to furnish new ways of thinking about things, which will include also new ways of writing things and um, new ways of looking at the structure. Um, so uh, here we turn the sort of bell, so we, we had the Einstein spooky action at the distance, we had a paradox, EPR paradox in the 30s, by the 60s it was a theorem, Bell's theorem, and by the 90s it was a, it was a protocol. Um, uh, we, we turned it into some, we, we turned it, the idea was to turn it around and say that given that quantum mechanics has these puzzling non-local features, how can we make use of that? For example, for information processing purposes. So in teleportation, uh, we transmit an unknown qubit from Alice to Bob. Uh, and what we do is, in some sense, we create a channel um, by setting up a bell state with two qubits, which we share between Alice and Bob. Alice performs a measurement in a certain cleverly chosen basis um, on the, <coughs> unknown, the unknown input qubit and her, her qubit of this entangled pair, which, of course, forces a collapse in uh, Bob's qubit. In general, uh, Bob has no, I mean, uh, um, by via, via preservation of uh, no faster than light travel and so on, Bob does not gain any information uh, as a result just of Alice doing this measurement. However, since there are two qubits here, there are only four possible outcomes of the measurement. And if Alice uses classical means to send two classical bits to Bob to declare what the out, which of those outcomes was achieved, Bob can perform an appropriate unitary correction, one of four unitary corrections, uh, after which, wonderfully, his qubit is what the original input qubit was, with this part of the system no longer containing useful information. So we haven't cloned the, the qubit, we've, we've uh, transmitted it. Um, and um, let's sort of probe a bit into the structure of this. <laughs> So the first uh, thing to notice is that we have the, the well-known map state duality, which is, of course, a matter of the uh, in finite dimensions having a anoidal closed category of Hilbert spaces. So the states in a tensor product uh, are in bijection with the linear maps from one component to the other. Um, so that's a way of thinking about states in general in a, a tensor product of two systems. Uh, they, they are labeled in a bi-unique fashion by linear maps from one component to the other. And that's saying that we can think of entanglement mathematically indeed as creating a channel in the sense that it gives us a function 
mapping one part of the system to the other. And we can think of that function being applied as a way of the information, so to speak, flowing from one part of the system to the other. Little notation for projectors. Um, a projector onto a one-dimensional subspace, uh, we label with, uh, so it's essentially going to be labeled by a vector and be a constant function up to scaling. Um, and, and such projectors will correspond to a branch of a, uh, a suitable projective measurement that we might perform. And we can combine that with a map state duality. In the case of projections on these bipartite states, we can label the projector with the linear map, which is in bi-unique correspondence with the state in the tensor product. So we can label projectors by maps from one component to the other. Uh, and the Bell state from this point of view is exactly labeled by the identity map, as we might expect. And um, so uh, an insight uh, due to Bob Cooker, which is a very important input into our uh, uh, work, is uh, to understand the compositional behavior, so to speak, of information flow through these entangled systems in terms of this labeling of maps, something that then calls out to be understood in categorical terms. But it immediately, just on the concrete quantum mechanical level, uh, gives us a very clear reading of how teleportation works. If we just go back a couple of steps to our picture of what was going on with Alice and Bob, so we prepare the initial Bell state over here and then sort of distribute the two, end, the two particles, one to Alice and one to Bob. Then, Bo then Alice performs a measurement and we will actually pass on a probabilistic... Uh, by, um, probabilistically through one of the branches of that measurement. Um, and one of the, one of the um, vectors in the, in the Bell basis is indeed the Bell state itself. So it's the co-state corresponding to the Bell state, in fact. So uh, the good, and that's the good branch because then we don't need to do anything with this unitary correction. That can just be the identity in that case. So let's read that in terms of first the operation of applying a projector that prepares the Bell state here of these two qubits, and then on these two applies the, um, uh, the projector corresponding to passing through that branch of the measurement. And what we get is the following fact, that we can track that by, the, these are the functions labeling the projectors, and we get this path which just exactly corresponds to the composition of these two maps. So the fact that the information flows through here to the output, the, the fact that the, the, the protocol works in this case is exactly read off from the fact that we can compose the maps labeling these projectors in this fashion. And the general case, um, we have, so we have four possible vectors in our basis, and we can now, this lays bare, so to speak, how one, could, how one should design such a protocol because the vectors are all in the Bell basis are all going to be labeled by certain maps. In fact, they're labeled by certain unitary maps. Um, and the corresponding correction, since we're just flowing through by composing the maps, should be nothing other than applying the inverse of the map labeling that vector in the Bell basis that we pass through. And the, 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 cor the, the correspondence that's achieved between these indices is exactly the task of the classical <coughs> communication to perform. Okay, so now our program, of course, is to capture this in our categorical axiomatics, to extend what we already have uh, so as to axiomatize these Bell states. And it turns out that we can do this in a very nice fashion, in a very direct and simple form, in a setting of, uh, of Dagobanoidal categories that we've been describing, which yields all the structure that we need to describe and reason about bipartite entanglement. And the other nice part of the story is it's not just a matter of hacking up an axiom to correspond to this reality. It's extremely canonical, both mathematically and logically. On the category theoretic side, what we're exactly doing is, part, is, is saying we have the structure of a compact category, very well-known structure, and the fundamental laws of which are actually essentially the triangular identities for a junction. So it's really something extremely basic. Uh, logically, uh, the Bell states correspond to axiom links and co-states to cut links, and we can track entangled quantum information flows by cut elimination. And this logical perspective is something, for example, uh, Ross Duncan and I have uh, developed. 
And diagrammatically, these are very basic geometric simplifications, and planar versions yield the temporally Lieb algebra that plays a central role in the Jones polynomial and so and related things um, in, in a very direct fashion. So these are really rather basic and nice things that relate uh, all these things together. Okay, so, um, and we also get a lot of other structure once we, once we assume this compact structure. In particular, we can get the trace and partial trace with all the key algebraic properties, and those, of course, play a crucial role in quantum mechanics uh, and quantum information. In some sense, with this, we have enough power to do all the multilinear algebra that we need without ever have needing any substrate of linear algebra sitting underneath it. And it can all be done diagrammatically. Uh, and indeed, diagrammatically, a partial trace closes part of the system by sort of forming a loop, as we'll see in a, shortly. And when we close the whole system, we just get outright loops. And that's the natural geometric interpretation of our scalars. Um, so they're loops, they don't connect anywhere else, so they can float freely around the, around the system. Okay, so how does the axiomatization look? So what we're introducing is particular arrows uh, for, each, um, for each type A. So here I'm, uh, we're assuming that we, we have a sort of uh, some um, duality structure. It's sort of become a, a sort of a slight question whether this is needed, but um, uh, so we assume that we have uh, an operation of duals on, on, on the objects, on the types. And we can think of that in terms of Hilbert spaces as using the fact that we have complex conjugation as a non-trivial uh, automorphism, which we can use to twist the structure of the scalar multiplication and the inner product. So that would be the interpretation of what star <laughs> means on a, on a Hilbert space. That's a more elementary and useful reading than thinking in terms of the space of uh, uh, the usual space of linear functionals. Um, so it's really a, a, just an indication of direction, so to speak. Maybe, di maybe direction of time, but uh, I, I, I don't want to commit to such a reading. Um, so, uh, so we have, for each such type, we have both a state, and a distinguished state and co-state of that type. And these we're going to think of as being our Bell states and Bell tests in terms of our physical interpretation. From a logical point of view, they're going to be something like axiom links and cup links, as I was saying. Anyone familiar with proof nets will sort of see the... Um, so we're sort of here combining two notations. The, the sort of lines are showing the way the information is seen as flowing through the system. But keeping the triangles reminds us that we're thinking of these as operations that can be performed or as processes in, in some sense. And by introducing these, we really are going into the realm of uh, something distinctively quantum. Now, the basic laws that govern these, as I was saying, are very basic kinds of things. So diagrammatically, it's just this obvious <coughs> simplification of a cup and a cap. Um, and you can see here that this is, if you think of it the right way, thinking of a monoidal category as a uh, simple case of a bicategory, and then of, uh, we're really saying that these things are adjoints. These are the triangular identities. So these are, these are very basic kinds of uh, equations. Um, and the way that we make this cohere with a dagger structure is that we require that the unit and co-unit are daggers of each other. You get one from the other by um, interchanging, by um, applying the dagger. Okay. Now, from that, we get a whole lot of structure. We get the fact that it's a closed category in particular. Um, but it's also, in a sense, co-closed. So we have both, so we can form, for example, both the usual, by currying, both the usual names of maps. Um, so we can, we can turn a linear map into a state, but we can also do the dual thing and turn it into a co-state. And we actually get then immediately, just from those two simple equations that I had earlier, so no general universal property postulated, but it then becomes provable that we get these, uh, these isomorphisms. And this is the general abstract form of map state duality. It's saying, in terms of our earlier discussion, exactly that states of the tensor product exactly correspond to arrows from one component to the other, but also uh, with co-states. 
Um, from that, now I, I'll sort of drop the arrows at this point and sort of go into more free-flowing diagrammatic notation. So from this, we can define a dual. Um, so this will be now, an, uh, so unlike the dagger, which simply reverse directions without changing the types, the dual of an arrow from A to B is going to go from B star back to A star. And this can be defined from this data. Um, and, um, yep, five more minutes. OK. Well, we're going to see a few diagrams. Uh, so uh, they will hopefully go quickly. Uh, so we can show, for example, that um, uh, the duality is involutive uh, just by a couple of applications of this straightening out of lines. Um, we can uh, show that as we move operations around cups and caps, we change their uh, polarity, so to speak. We go from F to F star as we can slide them around. And then we, we keep the same meaning of the overall operations. And again, this admits a very direct diagrammatic proof. So I'll just go through these pretty rapidly, just so you can see how the things are rather evident. I was talking about traces. Well, if you think of a diagram like this as being, composed, uh, being formed by composing uh, a cap and a cup here with a composition here, you see we're closing off part of the system and making this feedback loop. And that's the way that partial traces, and in particular total traces, will be formed from this language of compact categories. And here is one of the typical algebraic properties that we need, the fact that you can slide boxes around such loops. Uh, a very familiar algebraic property. We wrote it out in terms of the usual linear algebraic traces. And here is a special case of it that's extremely familiar, namely the invariance of trace under cyclic permutation. So that's just a special case of I, what I had. And here we see that we can use the previous property, moving things around cups and caps, which makes it accumulate two stars, and then use the fact that double star is an involution to conclude that, the, uh, that that property holds. OK, so now let's um, take a quick look at um, teleportation in these terms. So uh, one key thing that we can do is to open up projectors, which are usually taken as a fundamental building block of quantum mechanics. And we can understand what's going on with these information flow properties by opening up this internal structure and understanding through the map state duality that uh, when we get a projector onto a map labeled by onto a state in the tensor product labeled by a map from one component to the other, the structure actually looks like this. So it's a composition with cups and caps and, uh, uh, and the operation F. So that's kind of making the information flow in that projector explicit. And once we have that, we can see how to track information flow through a composed system. In fact, this is a key compositionality property that kind of essentially opens up the structure of uh, um, information flow through entangled systems as far as bipartite entanglement is concerned. And notice, by the way, this reversal of order. This is quantum mechanics, when you come right down to it, is fundamentally puzzling. And one shouldn't sort of claim to have understood it too well, uh, perhaps. Um, the puzzling thing is that if we think of physical, you know, if we think in some, you know, physical time in cautious terms, but doing first one thing and then the other, there does seem to be this retro flow here in the sense that logically the information flow comes from first doing F and then doing G. Whereas in terms of physical operations with the projectors here, this is the top half of the projector preparing a state, let's say, and this is the bottom half of a projector that corresponds to a branch through a measurement. So this seems to happen before this, but the logical information flow goes in the other order. So, um, and the way we prove compositionality diagrammatically is just pull one box down, one box up, and then we get an instance of our basic law in the middle, which we can straighten out, and we get this, this flow here. And from that, we can immediately read off the behavior of teleportation, um, that when we uh, do correlate the, um, the appropriate branch of the measurement with the appropriate correction, the net information, f and here's, so here's the preparation of the entangled qubit. Here's one branch of the measurement that Alice does. Here is the correction, the unitary correction that Bob does. The net information flow exactly is the composition of these two maps, which cancel in the right fashion. And a whole slew of protocols and other things can be um, analyzed in these terms. <coughs> 
Okay, so I need to be uh, wrapping up. Um, so let me, I think I have a couple of slides left, so perhaps I just have time for that. Um, so I just want to say, I mean, one thing that's uh, left um, unsaid there is how we, we deal with the correlation between um, the classical correlation, so to speak, between which branch of the measurement we went through and which correction we perform, and that dependence of one on the other, indicated here by the, uh, the same index I appearing, that's where the classical communication comes in. We want to be able to talk about such things in a single seamless formalism. So one way of doing it is to add further structure, well, we, one way or the other, we need to, to consider some additional structure. So one way of doing it is to add byproducts, um, which in a compact closed category, it's, if you have products, you have byproducts. Uh, and um, if we do that, then just from the usual functorial property, you know, we're going into a, a, a outcome of a measurement where the branching is given by, the, the, by which case of the byproduct, which factor of the byproduct we're in, and the dependence is then got by the fact that functorially we do different things in different cases. So this is just like, in some sense, like conditionals in um, uh, ordinary computing, but of course things are happening probabilistically and, and so on. And the propagation of classical information is expressed in qualitative terms in a very natural way just by the necessary property of distributivity of tensor products over byproducts, which must happen for general reasons in this context. So we think here of resolving a measurement, say, in Alice's site, so we know whether we're in case A1 or A2, and uh, distributivity allows us to propagate this information globally, so now Bob knows what case he's in, and he can perform the right operation accordingly. And using that additional language, we can encode the whole teleportation protocol, including all the, um, uh, the sort of this interdependence between measurement outcomes and consequent uh, sort of the, the, the unitary corrections, as a morphism in the category. And we can moreover, in fact, encode the correctness as the fact that a certain diagram commutes. Uh, and each of these arrows corresponds to sort of meaningful steps as far as the in, intuitive description of the protocol is concerned. There's another way of doing it. Um, I think we, there's still things to be understood in this area. This is a very nice and important thing introduced by Bob Cooker and Dushko Pavlovich, uh, using the idea of classical structures. They, they call them classical objects, but I, I prefer to think of them as structures, sort of choices of uh, basis, essentially. And they brought through that some very, I think, a very important structure to light that we have. Uh, so the point is what they're focusing on is just the operations of copying and deleting. And if you fix a basis, then on the basis vectors, you can perfectly well copy and delete, and you have a linear map that extends to the whole space. Although, of course, in general, for arbitrary states, it doesn't exactly copy and it doesn't exactly delete. So that's another way, so to speak, of internalize, I mean, of putting a particular measurement context into, into the discussion. But the point is that this operational view of it, where it turns out an important aspect is having a Frobenius structure, which is also interplays with the dagger structure, gives you a lot of uh, the ability to catch a lot of important context, uh, uh, further points. Okay, so I should finish. And I'll just finish by mentioning a lot of things that I haven't had time to tell you about, but are interesting. I've already mentioned the first one, namely classical structures. Um, it turns out there is a very interesting uh, sort of view one can take on the axiomatics of no cloning and no deleting from this perspective. Um, I think Ross may say something about this. But essentially, in the same kind of vein as results we know from categorical logic, uh, for example, Joyal's well-known result that if we try and make a topos, if we try and make a topos two, uh, or Cartesian closed category two Boolean, we try and make it be also have a classical duality, the thing collapses to a preorder. So there are results in a similar flavor, which say that if you try and have the quantum structure that I've described and try and make cloning and deleting available uniformly, which one would have in a classical setting, then again the category collapses necessarily. Uh, and I think that's quite a nice perspective on 
these issues and the sort of the tensions between quantum and classical. Um, although on the uh, yeah on the other representation theorem, once we put byproducts in, we're not too far from the territory of the Doppler-Schwarz theorem on the one hand, or Deligne's. Uh, result about um, Tanakian categories, uh, a kind of representation theorem for Tanakian categories. And um, I think there should be a nice result which should emerge, hopefully not too long, that will say under what additional assumptions um, uh, we get a representation theorem into Hilbert spaces. But certainly the, the general, the level of generality here is greater than that, so at some additional assumptions are needed. Um, and there are connections on the geometric side that I've mentioned, which also relate to current developments in uh, topological quantum computing and so on. And um, we may consider, well, yeah, okay, uh, right. And, and then some things that have question marks after, which means that at the moment they're entirely speculative. So. <coughs> I won't say anything about them, and I said I'll stop. I'll stop right now. Perfect. That, that, that's like a scaler, as I was describing. You don't need inputs or outputs. Uh, Well, uh, as, a, as what, where, so a place where I got to, it's more general. So in the sense that, for example, you can have, you can have signaling, you can have signaling? Oh, well, um, uh, now what we've been looking at, uh, I mean, I was mentioning this connection with no cloning, which sort of extends to no broadcasting. Or so, you have, for example, uh, violation of the Stevenson bound, but no signaling, like PR boxes. Sorry, I didn't catch the last violation part. Violation of the Stevenson bound. Oh, right, so yeah. PR yes. boxes that are not signaling, but they are super quiet. Yes. Well, I, I mean, you know, it would be nice to get a sort of clear story about uh, Bell inequalities and things beyond in this setting. I, I wouldn't say we have that as yet, but I'm, I'm, I, I, th I, think, I think the point is that, that this provides a very nice setting for looking at these questions. We've already found, I mean, certainly the way of looking at... Um, the no broadcasting and no cloning seems to be different from other approaches in the sense that it's, uh, it, it is quite logical in flavor and that one says that if one tries to add too many ingredients that are incommensurable in the same way as sort of adding some sense classical like features with uh, constructive features in the, in the sort of uh, usual to uh, topos theoretic setting as, as with uh, Schweil's lemma, then you overload the structure so it collapses. I mean, since, since, you're an, uh, since it's a sort of algebraic structure, the worst that can happen is it all collapses down to where you lose the process structure and it trivializes. So, so, the, so, the, so the, that's, the kind of, that's the most natural kind of result in this setting that says that various combinations of features are impossible. No, because I, I want to mention that uh, all these uh, no cloning, uh, blah, blah, can occur also in this more general field. Yes. Actually, classical mechanics is the only exception. It's not the general case. It's yes, the yes, yes. And what yes. happens, I think, is the point that you can keep the same structure and you can take larger sets or smaller sets of transformations. Because your transformation is a not operator. It's a transformation. And then, and then it, depending on the size of the set of transformations, you can have super quantum uh, Right, yes. Now, I mean, certainly the, the one should be able to discuss a range of theories in this kind of setting. I mean, one, one approach that uh, with, with convex theories, uh, where, where, which has been another approach, has been used to prove results about no broadcasting and no signaling and so on, I think uh, seems an interesting and possible to relate that to what we're doing. But anyway, I'd, I'd be interested to talk to you further afterwards. But. Well, one, um, one point right at the beginning is that the usual C-star algebra setting is not typed, um, right? Um, uh, 
So you just have an algebra. Now, of course, you can have a C star category, um, but, you know, but having types is rather important uh, and uh, you know, it's obviously a pervasive thing. I mean, it's like, what's the difference between a monoid and a category? So a category is kind of a multi, a, a typed version of a monoid, I mean, in its most, in its simplest terms. And that, that makes a surprisingly profound difference, because when you generalize from monoids to categories, you get something that's so general that it can include partial orders as well, you know, which is, so even at the very first step, there's something surprising there. So that's one point. Um, and uh, you get the, um, uh, and from that, I mean, you get the whole idea of the monoidal structure and the, the things I was, I was discussing. Um, perhaps again, we should uh, sort of uh, discuss that at further length later.